Hey guys, so you want to get into Airbnb investing? Well, congratulations, I've created a playlist just for you. Now, if you're watching through the playlist, this should be a few videos in, you've already watched the lender videos, that's the first step to getting your property is getting pre-approved. Find out the loan for you and that's great. The next step is what we're talking about today. So today, what we're talking about is the top five things that you need to look for when you're trying to narrow down an area, territory, neighborhood, for you to get your first investment property. So let's get into it. So the first thing is that you wanna consider whenever you're looking for the territories and neighborhoods, maybe you're scouting it out on Zillow, is that what are the reasons why people are coming into your city? A lot of times people think that it's more about like games. So they're coming into town for, I don't know, like a basketball game, football game, or something like that. And that is true, there are people coming into town, but that's not as sustainable as these other things I'm about to mention. So the first thing I want you to think about whenever you're buying your property, is this property located next to some kind of employment hub? So over here in Dallas, we have in North Dallas, the Frisco, like McKinney, Plano, Allen area. They're seeing a big boom right now and just a lot of new jobs and a lot of new corporate housing or a lot of corporations moving to that area and starting their headquarters there and so that is a really big pusher for a lot of demand for that area as people moving there for the jobs but with jobs you might be thinking well they're probably trying to get an apartment or a house that's not necessarily true because a lot of people are coming in from out of town for meetings or a lot of people are coming out of town just for actual just employment opportunities to fly in and just start interviewing and there's also a lot of consultants that are coming in and out as well there's meetings there's seminars there's all sorts of stuff right now the whole idea of staying at one office and starting to work there until it's time for you to leave doesn't really exist anymore people travel all around with their jobs and a lot of that has to do with just the growing job market and also people don't necessarily they want to always stay in hotels they want to feel like more than more at home and they want to sometimes get a good deal depending on the situation and if your house looks awesome and it's a good location they'll probably rent from you airports right so everyone thinks that I need a place right next to an airport because it's going to be really convenient for people flying into town that it's true, but I want you to modify it a little bit. And so whenever you're thinking of this, your real customer is not the actual person flying into town that wants to stay next to the airport. The real customer is the person that is doing the flying. So the pilots are gonna be in town for like a day or two, and a lot of times they're just stuck in this life of going bouncing from hotel to hotel. But if when they come into town, they are frequently on the same flight path, so they always are gonna be flying in, say for instance this case, flying into Dallas. And so when they come to Dallas, if they know they've got that house that they always go to, it's gonna feel like their second home. And I've talked to many pilots and they just hate that hotel life, just basically always coming in and coming out. It doesn't feel like they're ever at home. So you can create that home for them. Also flight attendants are in the same, same bag, uh, bag here. Bag, bandwagon, boat, whatever. And so they also are in the same situation to where there's a lot of them and they all talk. They're also, there's a lot of them that are in Facebook groups and they're in mass text messaging groups as well. And they basically talk about how, where they should go, where's the best deals and where's the cool spots to hang out at in the cities that they're in. So you can be in that chat group if you just get in with one of them and then they can just basically blow up your, your listing. And so you go, you make it to where you do the entire listing but then you can break it up into individual rooms as well, and that would really be great for marketing to those flight attendants. And so remember, they need short-term housing as well. It could take a day, two, sometimes they'll be in town for like a week or so, and it'll just bounce out between all the friends. So keep that in mind. But if you do that, where should you do that home? Well, so if we're doing this mentality with we need to be serving the pilots and the flight attendants, can you just do it anywhere? Not necessarily. So the, the airport's here, and then all the cool stuff and all like the other things I'm about to mention are over here, then you wanna try to get your investment home between those two spots. And so if you're just focusing on just the airport, then if you buy a house over here, then the problem is is that okay, that works maybe for the airline pilots and the stewardess, but everyone else that comes in town, they're all trying to go this way. So now you're just cutting out, just like the, the situation with the sports, now you just got this as your target market. Don't do that. Try to keep it between two points of interest. Okay, cool, moving on, next one. I really, really, really like buying homes that are next to medical centers. And so 
it's you're you're feeling like you're doing some good. Uh, a lot of people are coming into town for some families that have or family members that might be doing treatment. They might be flying in from other countries or other states to do some kind of like medical treatments. In my case, we've had a lot of customers use one property for cancer treatments, and cancer treatments is hits home for me because of a personal situation I had to go through with my mom. And whenever that time comes, you don't want to put your parent or your loved one or you yourself. You don't want to be bouncing in and out of hotels, extended hotel stays and stuff like that, you really want to feel like you're home. This is a really stressful time in your life and you want to feel like you found a spot that you can just depressurize and just be in this safe zone and call this your second home. You can't really feel that way when you're in an extended stay or in a hotel. So you can be that person's next home. And what's great about this is that these are like the lowest maintenance people you can possibly get. They normally book for a month, two months, sometimes five months at a time and they'll pay that premium rate because your premium rate is still much less than if they did an extended stay or a hotel for that same amount of time. And so you'll have a consistent deal flow of people coming in that you actually are helping. You're giving a service. You're not just doing this for money. Now you're actually helping out a family in a time of need. So medical centers are great, but not only for that one kind of clientele, you also have traveling nurses as well. And so people that are coming in from out of town for a few days or a week or a month or whatever it is, there's a lot of traveling nurses that come in and out of cities all the time. And I don't know if you know anyone that is a nurse, but a lot of times they'll work for multiple days straight and then sometimes they don't want to drive all the way back to where they're at just to have a few hours of sleep or if, you know whatever it is. They might just have a one day off and they have to be right back and they just need a place to crash for the night. And so you can be that place that they can crash. And again, just like the flight attendants, they have a very small community and they have message boards and Facebook groups like I said before. And then they'll start telling their friends that, hey, this is the place to be. I want, you're the ones that I get along with whenever I'm in town. Let's just all rent out this place together. Or this is where I get my room. There's multiple rooms. You need to rent one of the other rooms as well. And so just be constantly full with these people, just constantly spreading the word about your business as well. Uh, lastly, what I want you guys to consider is convention centers. And so it's really cool to be next to downtown, especially like downtown Dallas. I don't want to live in downtown Dallas. I don't like putting people in homes or apartments in downtown Dallas. I personally am not a big fan. A lot of downtowns are kind of gross and Dallas is one of them, but we're working on it. But as far as people coming into town, downtown has a lot of events for people that are in town for a short amount of time. And so we have huge conventions that come into Dallas. It's like hypothetically, not hypothetically, literally one of them is Mary Kay. And so Mary Kay comes in and there'll be tens of thousands of people that come into town, but there's just not a lot of space for a huge influx of people like that. And so what happens, they're forced to actually go into Airbnb because there's just not enough property or there's not enough hotel rooms to fill that amount of people that come into the market at that one time. And so you can be taking advantage of those big old events that come in. K. Bailey Hutchison in Dallas is also a big convention center to be next to. And even some that I never even heard of before. There's one called Dallas Market Hall that I didn't think was a real thing, but then I started getting a lot of listing, uh, I started getting a lot of people booking my listings because they always ask, how close is this to Dallas Market Hall? I was like seven minutes away, what, what are you doing there? And a lot of times they're coming in to get like really good deals on some kind of items, some kind of uh, merchandise, or they're trying to sell their own merchandise. And so figure out what is bringing in a large amount of people to your area and capitalize on that by being as close as possible. Cool? So that was a big one, that was a doozy. Let's move on to number two. So number two is kind of like a part one and part two. We're gonna divide this up into two and three. And so number two is you got to make sure that the area that you're in is a called a gentrifying area. And so this term kind of has a negative connotation, but let's go over what this really means is that in Dallas, there are really affluent areas. And most of the people that come to me whenever they're trying to buy property and like, oh, I want to buy an Airbnb property in, say, for instance, Lower Greenville, which is, you know, or M Streets, which is like a... 500 if you're lucky, but 600, $700,000 and up, all the way in the millions for properties. And so, yeah, cool. If you are wanting to buy at the top of the market and a really expensive house, which is really cool, but the thing is your mortgage is gonna be like really, really high. And so it's gonna be hard to make profit on that. 
So what you really want to do is find the neighborhoods next to those neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods that are gentrifying in the sense that the original community that was there is now being flipped. All the properties are starting to flip into nicer, newer properties. You can also tell this by the fact that there will be empty lots or there will be like a home that was built in 1900 or 1920 and it's starting to fall apart. And then right next to it, there's like this really nice brand new town home or something that just got built. And you can see that people have already spent a lot of money and time and research into figuring out if this, prop if this uh, area is going to develop. Another cool way to figure out if this is going to happen in the area that we're talking about is that if you see typical traditional restaurants for the area that are not very well known and uh, kind of lower price points, if those start to be uh, flipped into newer, trendier, kind of strange spots. So if you saw like uh, Michio Kana or something like that turn into like a really cool, nice, hippie, or hippie, uh, hip ramen restaurant or something, if people are willing to spend $15 on a ramen bowl, then you're probably in an area that is attracting the new kind of, uh, new kind of millennials or something like that. If you see a place that's gonna sell avocado toast, or you see a place that's selling like $7 lattes, then you're probably investing in an area that is going to consistently grow just because it's bringing in that new kind of clientele. And so when, you gentrif when you're looking at gentrifying homes, you're not looking at the cool area, you're looking at the area right outside the cool area. That's really important to get that. And why do we do that? And so why we do that is because there is a way to make money on Airbnb with just cash. And so that's cool. You can buy a property and then you're making cash on it every single month. But if you buy a property in a gentrifying area, then not only are you making profit on it every single month, but in a year, two years, five years, if you bought a property for $200,000, that property could be worth $300,000 or whatever. I'm just using that as an example. And so in that case, then not only did you make, say for instance, uh, 12,000, let's say it's $10,000 profit a year, which would be really low if you're doing Airbnb investing, but let's just say for numbers, $10,000 profit in one year, but you also, your house went from 200,000 to 210,000 within that year, you actually profited $20,000 that year because the house actually went up in value. Now what you do with that equity is up to you. You can either use that to just have a higher net worth on paper and get better and bigger loans, you can do a, what's called a cash out refi. And so basically you pull that cash out and, buy, and put a new loan on the property and you can use that cash with whatever you wanna do. Or you can you know, just sell the house and you can make a profit. And so that's up to you, but it's nice to have those options. And so what you want to kind of think about is what is a class B neighborhood? Now let's talk about what a class B neighborhood is. So number three, so when you're looking at these neighborhoods, think about class B. B in the sense that there's class A properties and that's going to be a little bit above the market average and you're going to have class C properties which is a little bit below market average. And so let's break this down. So in Dallas around here, if I look around left and right, then I'm, I mean, literally looking left and those start at like a million, a million point five. And so that is not class B. That's not even close to market average. If you look in your specific neighborhood and everything is in Dallas, like five, six hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand, you could trick yourself into thinking that that's just how much it costs to buy a home in Dallas. That's not the case. The actual, and this depends on which state you're in and which you know city, but I'm just saying for Dallas, because that's what I know, is that the average is like $250,000, $260,000 for an average home sale in the, in the DFW area. And so that's mind blowing for a lot of people. Like the idea of finding a house for that much is just like, where is that at? I can't even find that. And so with that being the market average, you want to try to find properties that are a little bit below that and a little bit above that because that's where the real growth is. And so what does a class C property look like? And let's talk about it. So class C property is uh, some of the indicators are bars on windows. If, uh, if there's a lot of chain link fence, every, all the streets are chain link fenced. If, the, if you see a lot of lines on the, on the roofs, and like it's basically the streaking on the roofs show that the property has not had a roof repair in a long time. Uh, if the siding is, is broken and busted up, if the grass is really high or if there's no grass at all because they haven't done the tree uh, trimming and so therefore it's shaded the entire area. Um, there's like fences in the backyard being knocked over, like they haven't fixed the fence. If there's on one three bedroom house, if there's 10 cars outside, 
then that's a really good indicator as well, especially if those cars don't have wheels on them, if they're on blocks, that could be a thing. Loud music in the area, people just walking around aimlessly or just staring at you as you drive by. All these things are really good indicators that you are in a class C neighborhood. Now, what's the difference between a class C and a class B neighborhood is a class B neighborhood is typically gonna have homes that are single family homes, three twos, and uh, there you can find some bungalows, you can find uh, just homes. You're lucky to find the homes if they have a brick, uh, if you have a brick base. So if instead of having a wood paneling on the outside, it's, it's bricks on the outside. Um, if some of the homes have been recently repainted, if the grass is really well kept, um, if you start seeing some of the flips in the area, if the flips are showing that there's some homes that are nice and there's some homes that are like much nicer, then these are more indicators of a class B neighborhood. And that like we said in the last number two is that it's probably gentrifying that neighborhood. And then class A is that's the next step up is basically all the homes are basically revent, uh, re revitalized. It's in a revitalized area. It's really nice, big, mature trees, nice, clean streets, and everything like that. So if you're investing in that, then you're probably you're investing too much. You need to probably scale it back a little bit. That way you're not overspending on your house, and that way there's still room to grow as the neighborhood grows. So that is what's really important is investing in class B neighborhoods. Don't invest in luxury properties. I'm telling you, don't do it. Number four. Number four is super important that you realize that Airbnb can definitely go away at any given time. And if you have five, 10, 20 properties, all that makes sense on Airbnb investing, but then they don't make sense traditional investing, then you're left holding the bag on a whole lot of loans you cannot pay. And so don't be that guy or girl. And so what you want to do is buy these properties with the idea of traditional renting, which is try to try to keep this in mind, 1% rule. 1% rule is like the golden rule in real estate investing. And in Dallas specifically, and especially if you're in California, New York, or any of these bigger uh, populations that have really inflated markets, it's going to be even more difficult to get this. But if you just do with that in mind as close to possible 1% rule, then you can be successful in all the homes that you purchase for long term. So what is one percent rule that is if you buy a house for two hundred thousand then your goal is to get the traditional rents will that home make sense for two thousand dollars a month keep in mind though that's not necessarily a must you just want to be as close as possible so even if you are renting it at seventeen hundred dollars or so a month versus at two thousand dollars a month then it's still probably going to work there's just not going to be as much cash flow as long as you make a hundred dollars cash flow over the base price and what you're paying per month then it's not it's not a bad investment traditionally it's just not going to be the most profitable but over time you're getting your debt pay down so it's going to be fine and so another thing that you guys can consider is say for instance in we we're talking about m street or greenville earlier some of those uh, homes go for like 250 sometimes 300 dollars per square foot what in dallas i know right and the rent in that area is like a dollar 75 to two dollars per square foot for rent and so it really the 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 gap is large and so if you want to buy a house for 250 dollars per square foot, then you have to make sure the rents are going to be around $2.50 per square foot as well. Now, if you guys don't know about this and you don't know what I'm talking about or you don't know how to do the math, that's fine. That's why there's real estate agents. They can do that all for you. But so that's just the main thing. We can move on real quick, but I just want to make sure that you guys buy homes that make sense in our traditional market, not just Airbnb. Now, before we get into the fifth one, I want to do a quick reminder. If you guys could, make sure to like and subscribe, comment below. I am really excited about showing you guys all this free content and there's gonna be no kind of coursework. I'm not gonna ever charge you guys for any of this stuff, but I'm really putting a lot of time and effort into educating you on how you can retire through Airbnb investing, and I hope you guys appreciate that. And by showing me your appreciation, all I want is just some feedback and just some engagement. I'm trying to create a community here. If you leave a comment below asking a question, I'm gonna answer it. If I can't answer it quickly, then I'm just gonna make a big long video about it and then personally respond to you in the video. So thank you so much for being so supportive so far and make sure to hit that notification bell and therefore you know when I post the next video that can change your life forever. Okay, let's get into the last one. The last one's kind of controversial. I live in Texas, and so that means there's a lot of conservatives in Texas, and a lot of them that I talk to don't believe in a thing called climate change or global, or global warming. And so if that is you, that is fine. You're welcome to believe whatever you want. 
And that's the great thing about being in America. But scientifically speaking, there are changes that are happening in the world right now that we need to be aware of as real estate investors. Now, what are some of those things that you need to really focus on to make sure that you be successful for the next 50 years, not the next five years? So we are having an issue with water in general. And so if you're next to a body of water that can potentially at one point in the future flood, then you need to be very mindful of that and you want to be at high ground. And so you don't want to be at or below sea level if possible, unless you're really far away from a, from a floodplain. There are maps in every single territory in the United States of floodplains. And so you can go online and you can check this potential house and where is it in a floodplain. If it's in a 500 year floodplain, then you're relatively safe. But we just had uh, like a 500 year storm or 500 year flood in Houston that happened like twice in the last like less than five years. And so even though it's a 500 year flood, things don't make sense anymore. Things aren't as normal as they used to be. And so you got to keep that in mind. Try to stay away from big bodies of water that could potentially flood. Also, if you're buying the property because it's next to a body of water, say for instance like a lake, then you might not be happy what happens in the next 10, 15 years. That lake is either going to flood depending on how it gets its water base or it might dry out if it doesn't have like an underground aquifer or something like that. All right, that's it guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It's a lot of information that I packed in here, but I'm going to be doing that in all these videos. If you guys need to go back, take notes, write stuff down, you can do it. If there's a little speed button, you guys can lower the speed. If I'm talking too fast, that's totally fine too. I really want to make sure that you get this information. If you need me to expand on anything in a future video or you have any specific questions, make sure to reach out to me. You can get me on Instagram as well at Sean Ray Real and I really love you guys always being supportive. I'll see you guys soon and make sure to watch the next video in which we're going to be talking about specifically five things you need to look for when you're buying the actual home itself. We talked about the area and let's talk about the home specifically. All right, I will see you in about five seconds because you're going to hit next, right? Just hit, you can just hit the button, whatever. I'll see you in like five, four, three, two, one.